So welcome, I am Dr. Anna Smith, and I would like to welcome you to the Creatively Critical Tech Research Design Practice Speaker Series. I have some introductory remarks, um, and they take a, bit, a minute, so while I make them, I would like to welcome all of those of you who are joining um, to, tonight uh, to go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat, and you can find the chat button on the bottom of your Zoom screen, and then within the chat, um, you can, should be able to move from chat to panelists to chat to everyone. So flip over to everyone and go ahead and tell us where you're joining us from and, and what you do in education. Uh, so we're gonna keep the chat open as much as we can to allow for a dialogic experience. So please respect that and keep your comments productive. Uh, so this, this series, uh, the Cre Creatively Critical Tech series, comes to us from the Education Now Lab at Illinois State University in the School of Teaching and Learning. And the Education Now Lab is a community-engaged research practice lab that works with and, and produces a range of critical interdisciplinary, public, academic, and new media scholarship with and alongside community members as we labor toward more just educational futures. We're hosting this series as part of a course called Critical Perspectives on Technology and Education, and we're sharing our takeaways uh, through social media uh, throughout the semester at um, Education, it, it, sorry, EDU Now Lab um, on both uh, Twitter and um, Instagram. And we're recording and sharing resources from each of the talks online um, at um, our tiny URL website. So let me give you that real quick in the chat too. And you can go to this um, website, add that there, um, if you want to see some of our previous sessions or the one from tonight uh, later. And then here are also um, connections that um, you can make to our social media accounts. Uh, we wanna thank Fakayo Oluto Miwa for her work on managing our lab online presence and accessibility. So thank you, Fakayo. Uh, the series is co-sponsored by the Illinois State University Office of Research and Graduate Studies and the College of Education. And we thank them for their generous support. In that, we recognize that we're working to make meaningful that Illinois State University is built on the land and waters of multiple indigenous nations who were forcibly removed, including the Illini, Peoria, and the Miami, and later due to a colonial encroachment and displacement to the Fox, Pot Potwatomai, um, Sauk, Shawnee, Winnebago, Iowa, Muscotin, Piankasha, Wea, and Kickapoo Nations. We also honor the indigenous people who we have excluded due to historical erasure and inaccuracy. You know, I have the script prepared for each of these sessions, um, and I think it's important for us to make those, those um, recognitions and it just hits different with the current conflicts. And so, um, yeah, so perhaps tonight we can uh, take a moment to commit what we're trying to do um, as we think about innovating towards more edu just educational ends. Um, we can commit our efforts uh, to, to making um, our education more humanizing um, for everyone. Uh, today we're pleased to be joined by um, Dr. Justin Reich. And I just realized I, I was going to ask you if you pronounce it right, or Reich. <laughs> okay, Justin Reich. But however okay, you right. want to do it, it's fine. Okay, no, Reich is, Reich is good. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Dr. Reich, Dr. Reich is an educational researcher interested in the future of learning in a networked world. He's a director of the MIT Teaching Systems Lab, which is in, aspires to design, implement, and research the future of teacher learning. He is the author of Iterate, The Secret to Innovation in Schools, which is the, our topic for tonight, and Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education from Harvard University Press. He's the host of the Teach Lab podcast and five open courses um, on, on edX. And Justin is a former fellow and faculty associate of the Berkman um, Klein Center for the Internet and Society at Harvard University. We also wanna welcome and thank um, our ASL interpreter tonight, Shelly Zimmerman. Thank you, Shelly. Uh, so uh, Dr. Reich, I will turn it over to you. Cool. 
Um, can I share my screen? I think you should be. <laughs> it's one of those settings. I believe I <laughs> switched for us. I've got, I've got host disabled we'll participant screen sharing. Oh, which is the, oh my which goodness. Is the other so let me that, that for you. Every talk on Zoom, <laughs> but I wouldn't sweat. Oh, um, another setting. All right, here you go. It's all yours. Bam, success. Great. Well, thanks so much for okay. being here, everybody. It's really great to get a chance to talk to you. Thanks, Anna, for inviting me. Um, you bet. Yeah. So I, what can I tell you about myself? Um, I'm a former high school history teacher. Uh, and in, in 2003, I was trying to get a job teaching world history. And a department head was interviewing me. And he said, can you teach world history? And I said, no, but I promise I'll figure it out by September if you hire me. And he said, well, OK, maybe. Um, uh, and then he said, uh, you know, another thing about this classroom is that it's a, our ninth grade world history is a pilot classroom where we have this cart of laptops in the back corner for any of you who are old enough. They were the blue and orange uh, clamshell MacBooks. It's really kind of iconic form factor. Um, and we had wireless connections in the building. Um, and uh, and my job was to, it was, would be to teach with them every day. I was like, you put a cart of bananas in the back corner of the classroom and I'll teach with them every day. I just, I really need this job. Um, and they hired me. And um, so in 2003, I had a chance to teach uh, uh, world history in a, in a classroom where every student had um, their own laptop. It's funny. I was looking back at some photos we have this, of the period um, of just like uh, kids smiling, sitting around tables with laptops open. And today it is a totally boring photo, which has no impact at all on audiences. But 20 years ago, uh, it was quite striking. Um, you know, I, I was certainly not the first teacher in America to have this environment, but I was relatively early on. Um, we had this uh, intranet service called First Class which basically did everything on servers that Google for Education does in the cloud. Now we have collaborative docs and messaging and all these kinds of things. And I loved it. Um, and uh, for a couple of reasons, one is it was right at the time that all of the world's archives and governments and museums were frantically digitizing everything and put it on the internet. And so to be a history teacher in those moments, um, in times when uh, you know my own study of history was defined by the scarcity of documents and all of a sudden, you know, we just have a deluge of primary sources. That was pretty amazing. And I love the way that teaching with computers let me turn responsibility for learning off my shoulders onto my shoulders of my students, let them collaborate with each other, collaborate with people outside of their classroom. So I did that for a while. Um, I uh, left teaching for ran family reasons. Uh, I actually sort of found myself unemployed for a year unexpectedly. Um, and I had a very entrepreneurial colleague um, where I first taught named Tom DeCord who one summer got a grant um, to learn how to teach history with computers. And the next summer was like, okay, I'm offering workshops. Um, it was like, like, I know exactly one summer's worth more than these other folks do. And so uh, he and I founded a consultancy and we spent a whole bunch of time trying to help schools and it was called Ed Tech Teacher, um, trying to help schools and districts who were making huge technology purchases, um, you know, from 2008 to 2019 or something like that. Um, do the best job they could and to have those purchases really enhance teaching and learning. Um, and what I saw in many, many places was schools spent enormous sums on technology and teaching and learning just didn't change very much. Um, at one of the first schools that bought iPads for all their students, um, I was interviewing students and, and asking them what they thought the best part of having iPads was, how their education was changing. And one of them said, these are so great. Uh, we can take notes for all my classes in there. I guess I would say, I would ask them, you know, what are they doing? They said their favorite app was Evernote. And the best thing about having these tablets was that they could, they didn't have to carry five notebooks into school. They could just have one iPad. And I was like, what are we doing? Why are we spending 800 bucks a kid to consolidate notebooks? Like that doesn't make any sense. Um, but there were, you know, in every school I visited, there were always a handful of classrooms that you could go to um, where, you know, that where the teaching would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And there was occasionally schools that you would visit. You go, wow, teaching is, and learning are really different here. Like this is not what I'm seeing in other kinds of places. Um, and one of those places that really struck me was a school in Southern California, uh, which, uh, which I was visiting actually not for consulting, but as part of my, my doctoral research um, and got to talking with faculty there and 
they told me about the ways that they were using this new tool, which has just been released called Google Docs, uh, just, just available relatively um, for, for a year, a few years at that point. And they had really managed to change the practice of writing in the school. They had all this peer editing going on. They had multiple draft cycles, feedback. And it wasn't just in one or two classrooms. It was in the science classroom, in the history classroom, in the English classroom. It was across grade levels. And so this was exciting to me. Why, you know, why is it that, what did, what did this school have going that other places didn't? Like, why were the practice, why, why was teaching and learning really changing here and not just technology adoption? Like they bought the laptops and whatever, but they'd gone beyond that in some important ways. And so what, then one of the questions I asked was, well, what are your, what are, what's your principal doing to support you? What's the school leadership doing to support you? I've, I've mostly been talking to teachers at that point. And, and a science teacher looked at me and said, oh, I don't think they know what we're doing. I'm like, what? I mean, <laughs> I'm in one of the only schools that I've ever visited where it really feels like investments in technology are leading to substantial changes in teaching and learning practices. And you're telling me that the principal is just like hiring subs and making sure the buses run on time and things like that. What's going on? So that... That is all to say that a puzzle that I have tried to think about over the last 15 years is why do some schools get better quickly and others seem to be more stuck? Um, what happens in the places where technology adoption um, leads to real changes in teaching and learning? And what, what's different, especially in those places where it happens not just in a couple of classrooms, but really system-wide? So there are two answers that, that that story I think leads to that I think are really important. And, and so the first part of what I'll talk, well, how about, I'll tell you this. Um, so then I wrote this book called Iterate that it essentially tries to answer that question and tries to give people tools to become the school that doesn't get stuck. And so Iterate iterates through three different cycles. Uh, the first is a descriptive cycle about how schools change called the cycle of experiment and peer learning. The second one is a way of thinking about conducting experiments called design thinking for leading and learning. And then the third one is about helping people do experiments and improvements in such a way that people feel like they're pulling oars in the same direction. And that's the collaborative innovation cycle. So here are two things that I believe to be true about how schools change. Uh, and this is a slide from like 2011, which was my first effort at describing this phenomenon. When practice changes in schools, it's because teachers do it. There are just not enough administrators. There are not enough superintendents and department chairs and instructional coaches and principals in buildings to change what teaching looks like in a sixth grade earth science class, in a fourth grade math class, in a 12th grade Mandarin class, in a seventh grade PE class, in a second grade music class, and everything in between. They're the only people who can take new ideas and actually implement them in ways that change young people's learning experiences are teachers and librarians and paraprofessionals and the folks who actually work with students every day in schools. There are ways that folks who are outside that role can help. Coaches can help, principals can help, superintendents can help, but the people who actually have to do the work are teachers, which is why the school in Southern California was able to make all these transformations without really their principal knowing about it. Because in a sense, you don't necessarily need, the, the principals are not indispensable for instructional change. The teachers are indispensable for instructional change. So teacher leadership is indispensable for making, even when you look at something that appears to be coming from the top down. Um, so all around the country, there's all kinds of reading initiatives, science of reading initiatives, and they might involve buying curriculum and imposing standards and all kind of stuff. But you know, as you all have studied education, no, education is a loosely coupled system. Um, aviation is a tightly coupled system. The FAA says to turn on these computers at 8,000 feet. All the pilots will turn on the computers at 8,000 feet. When a superintendent says, we're all gonna teach like this, the teachers go, eh, maybe I will, and maybe I won't. I'm gonna be here longer than you are. Um, teachers are patient pragmatists. They, um, they're very few. There's some teachers who are really enthusiastic about experimentation. There are a small number of teachers that are really cautious and hesitant. And the vast majority of teachers are sitting on the fence saying, if you can show me some evidence that this will improve my practice, I'm willing to put some time in it and change. All right, so teacher leadership is one indispensable component. Then you ask the question, who has the most impact on teacher practice? 
if we go to teachers and say like, why is it that you change your practice? Um, we consistently across a couple of different studies, there's not a ton of studies that do this, but one of the ones that I mentioned in the book is by a guy named John Diamond, um, who's at Northwestern at the time um, in, a, in a paper called Where's the Rubber Meets the Road. It was about changes in response to No Child Left Behind. He just surveyed teachers, why do you change your practice? And the number one answer was other teachers. Teachers change their practice when they see effective practice from other teachers. If you believe that to be true, and I do, then school change is a peer learning problem. School change, school improvement is a peer learning problem. There are gonna be a small number of teachers on the edge of innovation who are excited about changing things. If they can conduct some experiments and if those experiments work and they can share those things with other people, then instruction can improve. Where that doesn't happen, where the peer learning doesn't happen, individual classrooms can get better, but it's really hard for grade level teams to get better. It's really hard for uh, departments to get better, for whole schools to get better. So I described this as the cycle of experiment and peer learning. Um, and um, all throughout the book, we have this wonderful illustrator named Haley McDevitt who helped um, bring all these things to life. And uh, I was writing uh, about um, the cycle of experiment and peer learning as a merry-go-round. And she loved that. And we decided to have the whole book kind of be themed around playing and playground opinion uh, equipment. So experiments are conducted by teachers with their students in classrooms. Um, if those experiments have some success, then teachers informally gather with each other um, and talk about what's working, talk about what's not working. From those conversations, more people are willing to plan, try new things, invest, and that leads to more experiments. Where you see change happen in schools, it's out of this kind of flywheel effect. The teachers and students are on the merry-go-round. They are the ones like actually doing the thing. If you are not a teacher, if you, and if you're a PhD program or a master's program or you're aspiring to be someone outside of the classroom, a thing to recognize is that your job is outside the merry-go-round. Your job is to be helping spin the merry-go-round in such a way that it moves as joyfully, as collaboratively, as efficiently, as unroadblockedly as possible. Um, and then in the book, I try to describe four big buckets of things that school leaders can do to help the important work that teacher leaders are doing inside uh, the merry-go-round. Um, so one of those is how do you create spaces in your school for research and development? Like what's your, what's your research and development budget? Where do teachers find the time and the resources to be able to conduct new experiments? How do you have structures that support teachers learning from one another? Um, how do you put in place routines like looking at student work where teams of people that are doing similar things look at the outcomes of their efforts on student work projects? How do you have people do instructional rounds, observations, get in each other's classrooms, things like that? How do you create a culture where teachers across departments, across disciplines, across grade levels, share with each other their practices. Um, this picture comes from a description that I gave to Haley of one of my favorite professional development events. Um, it was in uh, the Peel School Board in Ontario. And at the beginning of the year, the Peel School Board, is it's cold there most of the year. So their school is built around this like giant hallway with a big atrium in the middle. Um, so at their beginning of the year event, they have somebody do a little keynote speech and get people a little bit excited. Then they have lunch in the atrium. There's a big buffet lunch. You go and you get a plate. And then the giant hallway is lined with tables all the way up and down. And at each of the table are teachers and sometimes students who are basically doing a kind of teaching fair. Um, these are the projects that I'm working on. This is a new technology that's available. These are new resources to support you. Um, here are some cool assessments that I'm using, other kinds of things like that. Um, and so, um, spread out along this hallway, people would grab this plate of food and move up and down. To me, it was just a wonderful visual representation of how peer learning kind of transitions into planning. Um, and then in order, so one risk of lots of experimentation is that if everyone is experimenting in different directions, it often doesn't lead to new collective capacity. Um, and so what you need to do to balance the autonomy and exploration is to try to get people moving in the same direction, having a shared vision, um, having a shared instructional language, um, 
is the way to have people be sort of pulling their oars together. All right, so that is the that is the first part of the book. It's a kind of descriptive vision. It says, if you want teaching and learning to get better, this is kind of what the process looks like. There are teachers inventing new practices. They're sharing those practices, even if they're not inventing them by themselves. I mean, they're getting ideas from their classes, from research, from the internet, from all kinds of things. But all of those things need to be invented, reinvented for this particular sixth grade earth science classroom, this particular group of third graders who need to learn to read with these kinds of constraints and so forth. Um, and then for the folks who are outside of the classroom, our job is to help them do that experimenting and that sharing as joyfully as possible. We've learned a lot in the last couple decades about how to help people do experiments in systematic kinds of ways. Um, and uh, I like talking about this with educators. I like talking about how there's a lot of stuff that I've learned at MIT from my colleagues in the Sloan School of Management about uh, entrepreneurship, in the mechanical engineering um, uh, department, in, uh, you know, in the biology and the sciences. Um, the, and so design thinking is one toolkit to help people experiment. Um, the way that I often describe it to folks is to think about how our industrial goals have changed or how our way of thinking about industrial improvement and change. So in the 20th century, if you're a history teacher like me, you have to include a little history lesson in just about everything. Um, so in the 20th century, we needed a whole bunch more electricity. We needed to win World War II. If you wanna win World War II, you need planes. If you wanna have a bunch of planes, you need aluminum. If you wanna have aluminum, you need electricity. Um, so people thought like, well, how are we gonna get a lot of electricity? And somebody was like, let's find the biggest river we can and put a giant dam in the middle of it. Um, and that was the Hoover Dam. And the way that we built the Hoover Dam is like someone came up with a scan of all the rivers we might put it in. They made a plan, somebody designed it. They got a bunch of teams together. They tested it, they put it into place. It kind of ran. Um, sometimes this, this is a very linear approach to design. It's a, it's a, the linear approach is something that schools will recognize readily. Um, Five-year plans, um, these sort of like, you know, committees that stretch out over long periods of time. Sometimes this a linear approach to design is called waterfall. You can imagine sort of the water starting on the top of feasibility and sort of cascading down all these steps as they evolve over time. Um, the signature weakness of waterfall designs is that if you make mistakes in the early phases in feasibility and planning, um, then those errors cascade into the future. Even if the mistakes aren't your fault, even if it's just the world changes. I mean, there are a lot of schools in the United States that polished up their five-year plans at the end of 2019. Um, and those plans were not that useful during the pandemic because the world changed. Um, in the 21st century, how are we gonna generate vast sums of electricity, far more electricity than the Hoover Dam ever generated? We are gonna take small, modular solar panels, and we are gonna cover the surface of the earth with them. Um, each of these solar panels every year in factories is going to be a tiny bit better and a tiny bit cheaper. They're gonna be installed by our high school graduates, college graduates, community college graduates, one panel at a time, one building at a time. And we are gonna generate way more electricity than the Hoover Dam ever has. I think, the way schools gets better looks more like solar panels than the Hoover Dam. I don't know very many schools that can say, we made this one big significant change and everything was different after that. But I've been to a lot of schools which say, we started this project as a pilot, we built it, we grew it, we expanded it, it went forward. Now it's a big part of what we're doing and it made things a little bit better. And then we turn to the next thing that's gonna make our school a little bit better. Um, this approach to um, small scale design is sometimes called agile design in contrast to waterfall design. This is an article I snipped 10 years ago um, when it was you know, sort of surging in interest. And basically software really helped people think about um, solving problems by building, solving big problems by building small pieces and expanding them. Um, one thing that's really cool about software is that you can delete it. 
Um, it's really easy to start something and you can't really like get rid of the middle third of the Hoover Dam. Like once the Hoover Dam is in there, you kind of got to stick with it. Software doesn't have that quality. It's easy to move in directions, find those directions, don't work and change. Um, software developers also did a really good job uh, developing a practice that they called a minimum viable prototype. Oh, I should, I should also say um, that people in software tended to abandon waterfall design because the world was changing so fast. Like you spend a bunch of time building software for bank tellers and someone invents an ATM. You spend a bunch of time making websites for people's computers and all of a sudden everyone has phones. So thinking about approaches that are more flexible, more modular or, or changeable sort of came naturally to software developers. They also had this idea of the minimum viable prototype. So like when the people who developed Uber started they didn't say to themselves, how are we gonna get drivers all across the United States? Um, they had this vision, which was, you should be able to stand on a street corner and pull out your phone and push a button and a black car should come and pick you up. And they built a very small app to be able to do that in one part of San Francisco, uh, supported by one or maybe a couple black car companies. Um, and then they grew and expanded. And then they like violated a bunch of regulatory guidelines and they were terrible for congestion and proved to be a horrible company. But um, that vision of a minimum viable prototype, I think is quite compelling. Um, so uh, the, the middle of, of Iterate is helping people think about some of these design thinking processes. They have a bunch of different names. Um, many people are familiar with the D-School and IDEO's approach uh, to design thinking. We built a cycle um, that in part um, had language that we thought uh, kids would be able to recognize um, so that it's something that could be used both in classrooms. That's the design thing for learning and the design thing for leading are things that uh, schools can do um, amongst mostly the adults to make school better. The, you know, to me, the heart of design thinking is saying, even if you have big, ambitious, exciting goals, don't start with months of mapping and planning out where you're going. Think about what is the smallest version of the thing that you could put in the world and get in front of people to test and try and start getting feedback on. Um, this on the top right is my favorite image of the book. I don't know exactly what this girl with wires and fire is building, but I'm pretty excited about it. Um, and you know, I was just hanging out with some educators at the Boston Teachers Union who are part of this teacher leadership group. Um, and they have these really bold, ambitious projects. They applied to do these projects with year long project plans and all these kinds of things. And I think they really enjoyed spending the evening thinking about, all right, instead of, wait, instead of like waiting months to gather feedback, gather ideas, what is the smallest version of this thing that we could put in the world on Monday and start getting some feedback from and start growing from and changing from? So I can talk more about any of these steps or how they work or things like that. Um, the, the third part of design thinking for leading and learning is saying, if you, as I said before, if you were to just get a bunch of educators, teachers and say, go do experiments any way you want to, um, students, the worst of that, students would find it chaos. Um, that's a little bit what we had in March of 2020 and April of 2020, when suddenly every teacher in the country had to like invent their whole school system online by themselves. Um, and for anyone who was a parent during that period, you know how utterly chaotic it was to try to help students, you, you know, log into different classrooms with different systems um, in all of their different classes. So part of what we want to have happen um, is to bring people together around what I call right size goals, goals that are sort of big enough and capacious enough that lots of different teachers from different backgrounds in the community can see themselves in it but they're not so large that they're impossible, you know, cannot be completed in our lifetimes, those kinds of things. Um, some of this material was originally released as an online course called Launching Innovation in Schools that I did with a fellow at MIT named Peter Senge, who wrote this wonderful book called The Fifth Discipline, which again, if you're older, um, this sold like a million copies in the 90s and was uh, um, a great guide, both for people in industry and for people in schools where sort of the key argument of the book is that really powerful organizations not only do what they're set up to do, but they have everyone in the organization be learning all the time too. So factories that make widgets don't just make widgets, they build the capacity of the people who make those widgets all the time. Schools don't just teach kids how to read, they teach all of us how to be better people and do our jobs better and become better educators and better family members and community members and all those kinds of things. Um, so like launching innovation, uh, like uh, design thinking for leading and learning and the cycle of experiment experience, 
we think about collaborative innovation as a cycle. Um, our uh, visual metaphor for the, the, the design thing for leading learning was the Polaroid photo, the instant photo that lets you see something new right away. Um, the gym class parachute is the um, visual metaphor for this work. Um, many of you probably remember the best day of the year was in gym class when the teacher pulled out the parachute. And the fun thing about the parachute is that um, you play all kinds of games where people individually have all kinds of roles and can play their own way. But the only way the parachute works is if you're all willing to grab the edge and flip it up and sit down underneath it and create this space together where then everybody can play and enjoy in their own individual kind of way. So to me, that when schools manage to balance that sense of coherence, that sense of direction with some degree of autonomy and experimentation, that's the sort of sweet spot for getting better. Um, we intentionally started this section of leadership in what we thought was something of a subversive place, which is to say, you actually, you know, most people, what they expect from leadership is someone pointing their finger and being like, we're all going over there. Um, what we think of leadership is, is bringing people together around ideas they care about. That's important in any industry, but in education where educators have so much autonomy, um, have so much capacity to close their classroom door and not participate in initiatives, that the place to start is where everyone wants to work together anyway. Um, that that teacher voice, that teacher contribution, everybody, you know, paraprofessionals, librarians, the whole game. Um, there's some really specific exercises, which I can talk about in questions if we want to, about how to maybe facilitate those things. Like one of them is called Four Questions for Innovation. And in the book, each, set, each of the cycles in the book has two chapters. And the first chapter is kind of like, here's the, the vibe and the theory and how we go about this. And the second chapter is more like, all right, here's like exactly what you would do with a group of people in your district if you wanted to get this kind of thing running. Um, the second part of the cycle is refining a vision and getting to work. Um, and, you know, one tough thing about teaching and sharing all these things is like to make a representation of it, you have to make a cycle and the cycle seems to have these discrete phases, but try to emphasize to folks, um, they actually overlap and you cycle through them multiple times. For instance, you don't refine a vision and get to work after you've brought all the people together and come to agreement because you never get agreement. Um, it is impossible to get all the people um, to work together. Really. And actually, the best way to get as many people as possible in alignment about something is to start getting to work on it. That when you start building things together, um, as my colleague Peter says, you know, if you watch a dance troupe, um, they don't all agree. They don't agree about what beautiful dance is. They don't all agree about what the choreography looks like. They don't agree about um, all kinds of things related to dance. But they are for the you know, hour and a half that you're watching them, they are aligned. Um, they are um, pulling together in a direction. And in fact, the act of doing that dance together is what helps create some of that agreement. Um, one of the exercises, uh, this is a quick one that you could take away that I really like to do um, with school folks. I call it the someday Monday exercise. Um, and I have people reflect on the initiatives you're working on, the things that are important to you, ideally things that you've gotten a bunch of consensus around. What does awesome look like? If you were just unbelievably successful a year or two years from now, what does that someday look like? What does it look like to have whatever you're working on really come to fruition in incredible, powerful ways? And that is fun to think about. And it is also daunting to think about because when we talk about big kinds of change, we go, man, I don't know how we're ever going to get there. So then you say, all right, well, what is the thing we can do on Monday? What is the next concrete step um, that we can take to move forward to try to have some new thing happen. And then a great little piece that I learned from Peter Senge um, is uh, when you start taking these steps forward, make predictions about what you think will happen first. Um, and then you are often surprised. It helps you a little bit make sure that um, the stories you're telling about change are grounded in, in reality and predictions. Um, there are some good questions in there. I'm going to talk for two more minutes and then we'll do whatever other questions people want to do. Um, the two last parts of this are working together through ups and downs. Um, when I started this work with Peter, I was like, what do we need this chapter for? This is a dumb idea. Like this is a, he didn't co-write. It was an online course we make. What do we need this unit for? Um, this isn't about touchy-feely stuff. Um, and, and, and Peter really helped me see that anytime you're asking people to change, they, you're going to have conflict and you're going to have loss. Um, any kind of change requires us to give up old practices 
And even when we feel really good overall about the change, even when we feel like we're moving in the right direction, um, and even in the best of circumstances where innovation work in schools feels joyful and collaborative and exciting, people still feel a sense of loss. They still have to say goodbye to old practices. Um, and certainly in my leadership, um, I think in lots of leadership, there's not enough time and attention to, to that loss. Um, and then there's a chunk of the book that's about measuring and adjusting and saying that even in school systems where teachers feel like uh, assessment has been weaponized against them, um, there's no way to get better without feedback. Um, with many initiatives, I mean, I learned this a lot doing things with technology, um, questions of measurements can be great places to re-energize. You know, there are a lot of places that I went to where they were just starting a technology initiative, trying to help them. There are lots of other places I went to where they were into it for a while and they were like, what are, what's going on? Like, what are we doing? What's happening? And a lot of times, you know, we want, we want to level this up. I would be like, well, what kind of measures do you have about how what you're doing is working? And they're like, I don't know if we have any. And then eventually they'd also be like, I don't even know what it would, I don't even know what we would measure. Like, why are we doing this? Why did we buy all this stuff? Um, and that's when we say, great. That, you know, yesterday was the best day to ask that question. Yesterday was the best day to figure out how technology is going to be in the service of learning. But if you haven't answered that yesterday, then today is the best day to try to wrestle through and answer that question together. Um, none of these things are magic bullets. Um, none of them are, um, none of them are easy. I do believe that they can be joyful. I feel like in the schools, you know, I mean, the thing that we're often wrestling with with educators is that they don't have a lot of time. That came up in the chat a little bit. Um, and to get better, we're often asking them to spend their discretionary time. We're asking them to spend their prep period, spend some mornings and evenings. And they are more, the, the one of the characteristics of schools where this really moves forward in powerful ways is that faculty really enjoy working with one another. Um, and they take joy in getting better with their colleagues. And so creating the conditions where this kind of process can, it can feel hard, there can be loss, there's conflict, but it feels like something that we overall enjoy doing together. That is sort of a key part of being successful. So those are three buckets of things that we could talk about more with any of them. Um, and the first part, the cycle of experiment and peer learning is trying to describe um, how it is that schools actually change, how instruction actually improves and the central role of teacher leadership and of peer learning to that and then how people who are not teacher leaders um, and educators and outside the classroom can support that process. Um, design thinking for leading and learning as a way of uh, providing some systems for thinking about experimentation, particularly for tackling big, hairy, exciting challenges in a series of small manageable steps. Like in the end, the people who are working on this stuff, they have a 45 minute prep period tomorrow. Um, and the thing that you want them, you know, these, these big, bold experiments you want to take, like a big chunk of that work has to be done in a 45 minute prep period. So figuring out how we break that down. Um, and then nothing motivates people devoting more time to that than success in early initiatives. And then how with the collaborative innovation cycle, do we have people working together um, to, to have a shared vision and a shared instructional language be motivating what they're doing. So that's half hour. I'll stop there. Um, and there are some good questions that are in the chat, but Anna, I will, um, I'll leave it to you to tell us how we should, how we should follow from here. Yeah. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate that. Um, overview. And we do have some questions there. And so I want to invite people to go ahead and if they have other questions about, right, about change in schools, about innovation, about the communal aspects that we've been talking about a lot of things <laughs> you'll probably have to catch up with in the chat. Um, uh, so go ahead and, and put those either in the chat or you can use the Q&A um, option at the bottom if you want to do that as well. Um, and then anyone in the call too, you can you can also just chime in here. Uh, if you want to verbally ask your question, you can do that if you're inside the call. <laughs> um, so one question that came up, um, and this is uh, from uh, Jose Ramos. Uh, thank you. I see a question pop up here. Um, that not everyone may be able to see. I think it just went to host the panelists. Um, it's this question about how do you stop something um, that seems like a good idea, or maybe even when I was reading this, I was thinking that seemed like a good idea to begin with, right? But now it becomes this bad idea. And it's grown so much. Um, and I, I don't know I ready, but that um, is an example 
uh, that Jose has given as, as something that seems like a bad idea and it just keeps growing. Yes. Um, so most, it is very common in these conversations to say the kind of stuff that I want to do, experimentation, design, thinking around, um, feels somewhat subversive and countercultural. Like I want to do this project-based whole child progressive stuff. Um, and, um, but my school wants to do test prep. Um, in 2008, there was a book by Tony Wagner called The Global Achievement Gap, where a Virginia Beach superintendent said, I feel like I'm playing on two playing fields at once, um, which is one of my favorite descriptions. Um, it, there's probably no way in the foreseeable future that educators will not feel like they're playing on two playing fields at once. Um, if you're in a school where the iReady test prep playing field is feeling overwhelming, um, the, you know, I, I think there's no, you know, there's no magic bullet to that. There's no automatic change to that. But the way that people will get excited about alternatives is if they can see some measure of success of other kinds of practices, like the, you know, the best measures of success would be like, look, it's the project-based learning stuff that we do that also improves test scores. Um, uh, you know, or it's a project, but you know, it's the, it's the new technology innovation, which has these kids who are chronically absent coming back or who are tardy coming back or other kinds of things like that, that sort of gets you some wins on both playing fields, but those things are hard. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I, I don't want I don't want to trivialize that challenge except to say like, how is it that we would convince people that there are better alternatives to like having kids sit in front of computers and have the computers program them? Um, well, like it will be create, you know, creating alternatives. Like, are we gonna create a giant, you know, a huge sea change in our school next week? No, um, but next week we can start thinking like, what is the most promising alternative to one thing that we're using iReady for right now? Um, and how might we put some small version of that in front of our colleagues, in front of our students, in front of, uh, in our classroom, start gathering some evidence that these alternatives are possible. Um, and that is, I think, you know, the, that, well, that, that is, that is how schools change. Um, and so, you know, it would, it would be nice to, I mean, I mean, the other thing you do is like, you quit your school and you go somewhere else and you build your new school from scratch and see how that goes and stuff like that. But, you know, um, for, for most of us, like we're in institutions and we leave those institutions to change. You know, there's another great question from uh, Mike that we'll go to next. Um, but I have a quick question here then too. Have you seen any, um, so, so how do we get this in front of people, right? How do we get these alternatives in front of other teachers, for, you know, from a teacher to another teacher? Um, and it's so, uh, you know, the time and the resources and the opportunities. Have you seen um, different creative ways that people are doing that? Yeah, yeah. Can and you give us examples of, of that? Yeah, so yeah. particularly around technology, um, or for any kind of research and development and sharing, our students are underutilized. That connects to Mike's question. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody was just telling me about a makerspace that they had put together where to get more faculty into the makerspace, they had an entirely student run professional development day. Like the students mm -hmm. like organized all the workshops, like they wrote up, <laughs> the teacher who was facilitating it was like, they wrote up lesson plans. There were lesson plans detailed for all of the workshops. Um, you know, there's a bunch of kids who are sitting in our schools right now and they think their school day is fine or whatever. Um, but if you told them that they could really help their teachers do a better job and teach them stuff, they'd be like, yeah, this is rad. And you like buy them some pizza or something like that. And you get hours and hours of work from them. Um, so that's one resource. Um, another thing to talk about in the book is meeting audits. Um, basically go through every meeting that happens in your school and ask yourself the question, how much of this is being, how much of this time is being spent on instruction? Um, and sharing instructional practices. And often the answer is not enough. Um, and so you say, all right, for all the bureaucratic stuff that you're doing, how much of that can be like typed onto a piece of paper, sent around an email, some other way put away. We were talking about with one assistant superintendent who was being totally buried by bureaucracy um, in meetings, logistics in meetings during the pandemic. And they were just like, all right, we have a two hour faculty meeting. It was, it was a long time, but it was weird because of the pandemic. All right. An hour of it is always for instruction, and we will not change that. Um, like that's it. like that's it. You know, our logistics will take as much time as we give them. So let's make them happen. You know, and then there are lots of other meetings, or PLC meetings, or department meetings, or grade level. Like there are other things we can control where we can say, how do we make this more about instruction? Um, uh, you know, how do you um, 
how do you, how do you create structures where teachers can get in each other's classrooms? I think an amazing thing about administration right now, it is it has never been an easier time as an administrator to do some of your work from classrooms. <laughs> you can grab your wirelessly connected laptop and go plop down in any class where kids are working on a project where they're taking a quiz and that teacher can go um, look at other things. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, one thing that here's the thing that is both like frustrating and gives me hope. Um, there was uh, around, around this, like, how do we make instruction, you know, like time for faculty to share instruction safely? My a colleague of mine at Brown, Matt Kraft, did a study in Providence about, this is a little bit different, but he did a study in Providence about interruptions. Um, and the amount of time that classrooms get interrupted is insane. Um, like the amount of learning time in classes that we lose to buzzers and phone calls and kids getting pulled out and all those kinds of things, it just adds up to like days of the school year in a typical classroom. So, so that's frustrating. But a thing he found in Providence, in a set of schools, all of which were under the same management, is that the, the amount of time that was lost to disruption varied wildly across schools. All of these schools like roughly have the same policies and the same technology, all these kinds of things, but they had developed different cultures. And in some schools, it was just like considered a real violation to interrupt class. And in other places, it was considered more of a norm. That's something that we collectively have control over. Like that's the kind of thing that we could say like, you know, like we're just gonna make sure that we value this together. Um, and that I think can lead to meaningful change. Thank you. And I and I was just leaving a pause for people to be able to <laughs> write in or or speak up there too. Um, uh, so yeah, you gave us a, an awesome example with um, bringing students in to lead conversations around innovation and teaching. Um, and so back to Mike's question here too. Uh, have you seen inviting families into this process? Um, I think we're. I think people yeah. are more conscientious of that now. Um, there has been, you know, um, much more of a movement around things like Design Justice, which is the name of a book that a colleague of mine who's MIT, Sasha Costanza Chalk, put together. Um, although the principle goes back to um, disability advocates who said nothing about us without us. Um, they're, they're mostly like concerned that like a bunch of urban planners, none of whom were disabled, were designing accessibility standards and resources for people who were disabled. It's like, well, let's get it small. So I, I, I think there's a lot of room for bringing families and students in. When we do that, we have to think really carefully about how we make sure that we make those opportunities for learning and design accessible to all students and to all families, that we're not just turning to the people who are nearest to us, who are easiest to connect with. But I think we should um, pull those folks in. So, there, you know, it like it, some of some of what a lot of what I'm trying to do with schools and educators too is to say there's so many time frames in school. The way we think about school is long. Like our classes go for a year. Our buildings have kids for four or three or four or five or six years. Our system is 13 or 14 or 15 years long. We just have these like long stretches we imagine, you know, and part of what's happened in lots of other industries is to say, let's think about two or three week sprints. Let's think about the kind of design that we can do in a much shorter period of time. Um, we often think like, oh, if I'm gonna have a new assignment, I've gotta give it to all my students at once. No, um, take two students and buy them pizza and have them do a version of your assignment early and see, you know, or have, like have an after school club that ha happens with this, have some students who need some additional challenge, do some things at a different time, sort of, take something, put in the, like, don't build a whole unit. If you've got a new idea, don't build a whole three week, you know, six week unit, um, build two essential questions and one key reading and like two of the key features of your final assignment and get that in front of some students, get that in front of some other people. Um, try, you know, and I think when we, when we think about design in these sort of smaller, more iterative chunks, then you can also say to yourself, like, no, we don't need a whole family advisory committee um, we, we need like a couple of parents to come in and talk with me about the early ideas about how I'm going to change my homework plans um, or whatever else it is that we think parents would be a good um, sounding board for and things like that. And that makes some of that sort of family. I mean, there are some kinds of things, you know, ideally when these when smaller things become more successful and they build up into bigger things, maybe that's when we do want to have a lot of student input, a lot of family input or whatever else it is. Um, 
you know, I mean, all the pitfall for all of these things is time. Um, but I think we also lose a lot of time when we don't get buy-in from community, when we don't get people on board. Um, you know, and again, part like part of what we're trying to do is saying like, how do we do, how do we do this thing first small for, you know, and there's like, there's a couple benefits of these sort of minimum viable prototype for kind of thing. Like a lot of our ideas are actually bad. Um, if you want to have a good idea, you usually have to go through a lot of bad ideas. Like that's a pretty consistent finding when, in product design and those kinds of things. When our, I, when our early executions are cheap, it's much easier for us to throw ideas away. <laughs> that didn't work. Let's try some other thing. Um, when we have a committee meet for four months um, to try something we're testing, it's just like it's a lot more painful to throw that stuff away. Um, so breaking things down into these sort of smaller, more mindful, more actionable pieces. Um, and ironically, what, you know, then what it does is people who felt a little paralyzed, like, ah, I would never be able to do this huge change. Like, oh, well, I can do that thing. Um, and then you get some energy when, you know, when, when things fail, you're like, oh, I'm so bad. I can, you know, I can do another one of those. And when they're successful, you sort of build on it. Grow. I mean, I, I, you know, again, I don't want to like trivialize any of this as like magical stuff. Um, there's all, you know, a series of Monday stones will sometimes, will often fail to lead to someday. Um, you know, like incremental, incrementalism has its challenges too. Um, but I think if we were to look at all the kinds of, of change initiatives that we do in schools, we'd find a lot of them where we could get a lot of energy um, from thinking about um, incremental, iterative, growing kind of change. And I can see how that, that allows for that, um, for not just any kind of change, but that responsive change to, right? To, to you know, whole representative samples of, of, of what know, students are thinking, what, you know, like, what are students we actually, are, yeah, are we doing like, what we are hope we're doing? Are we actually changing yeah. student work outcome? You know, like, yeah, you compare it to these things where like, we bought a zillion computers and spent a gazillion dollars on it and nothing was different afterwards. Um, I mean, my students, right, you know, so I, I teach at MIT, I teach undergraduates and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, you know, I have, I, for many, for maybe 10 years now, I've asked them to tell me their ed tech story and I'm like right in the middle of the smart board generation, um, right in the middle of the generation. <laughs> yes, of kids, like in the middle all of the, the computers. Of the <laughs> like, like, yeah. Smart boards appeared in all of their classrooms um, and were <laughs> yes. not used and shoved in the back and thrown away and things like that. And you, you know, you just think to yourself like, oh man. Um, we could have like, we, we could have just bought one of those smart boards and seen if it was helpful and found that it wasn't and they got rid of it. Um, and then put all that time and effort and energy into something else. Yeah. Um, that, I mean, that has you know, the other thing that I tell people whole... about this, I mean, this yeah. is one way that we can use kind of like the positionality of MIT is like, if you, if, if <laughs> when, when I talk to teachers, like if your kids graduate from high school and they come and work with me or my colleagues at MIT, this is what they will do. Um, like if you came into my lab, I'd be like, we're going to build cool stuff and you're not going to build that whole thing at first. Like you're not going to build a whole online course. You're going to build like one assignment for it. And we're going to get some feedback on it. We'll bring it back. Um, but if you went to the Sloan school of management, they'd be like, oh, you want to start a business? Like what's your minimum viable prototype? Let's get it out there in front of people. If you were to do product design in mechanical engineering, like let's go in the shop and let's build the tiny version of that before we build the giant version of that. If you were to go into the biology department and they'd be like, that sounds like a really cool experiment. Like, you know, can and you do it with one cell before you do it with a slug before you do it with something else. Um, so it's uh, it has it has become a pretty standard way of thinking about making change. It doesn't work for everything, you know. It's I mean, it, it's hard to do iterative design on nuclear reactors and things like that. But but again, I think a lot of what we do in schools looks more like uh, um, looks looks more like solar panels in the Hoover Dam. Awesome. Um, we're coming up on our time. And so I see this question in, in the chat uh, that might be a great place to, to end on. So how do we help other people catch this vision of experimentation in schools and, and you know, small makes? And uh, so uh, Josh had asked, uh, as I prepare for um, parent-teacher conferences the next two days, how do we help not just our colleagues, but parents move past what they experienced as a student to what we're talking about with more experimentation, more flexibility, more responsiveness um, in schools today. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are, you, you'll probably get the like, there aren't answers to these, like there's no recipe for any of these things, um, except to say that if I felt like I had parents 
who had some concerns about the way that I was trying to make change, I would really try to listen to them. Um, my, I've, I've worked with a lot of educators who didn't want to see schools, um, who didn't want to do the, the stuff that I was trying to get them to work on. Um, and I found in a lot of years talking to them that they are not recalcitrant, that they are not um, anti-improvement. Um, they have some good reasons to believe that where things are right now um, is emerged from a carefully, from, from a well-refined process. Um, and so talking to people and honoring their concerns, if, if people are objecting, is always a good place to start. And then the way you get people to buy into stuff is, you know, sometimes you can get them buy into stuff by making a really good plan and presenting that plan and having them go, yeah, let's do it. Um, but I think a lot of times the way that you get people to buy into stuff is you do a very small part of that thing um, and have them see that it's working and that it aligns with their values that you've brought them together around things they care about. And then you say, and because we have this empirical evidence of success, because we try, because we know that tardies are our problem and we did this thing and here's how a couple fewer students were not as tardy that week. Let's try a bigger version of that thing. Um, and that can feel really, you know, I think a lot, a lot of that teacher leadership feels daunting when you're not the principal, when you're not the superintendent, when you're not the person who's sort of calling the shots. Um, and all I can say, is, having spent a lot of time in schools, um, is that the, the change and the leadership gets done by people who had no authority to do it. Um, so much of instructional change is guided by people who raise their hands and were like, I would like to work with some of my colleagues to do that better. Um, and sometimes people get in the way and throw roadblocks and things like that. But a lot of times they're like, oh, well, if you can do that, that'd be, you know, show me that it works and we'll do a little bit more of that. Um, and so, uh, you know, not, none, of, none, of, none of these things are magical, um, but I'm hoping that, uh, um, that some of you at least are inspired to tackle some of these big someday problems with some Monday steps and that some of the cycles in the book can help you, uh, help you think about those things. Um, so yeah, iterate, iteratebook.com, um, go to your favorite local bookseller or, or, or giant mega technology corporation, wherever else you buy books and, uh, and grab a copy. Thank you, Justin. Really appreciate your, your time tonight and uh, sharing those resources. And at your book, um, on the, on that website, you also have some resources and videos too that that people might be able to share with their colleagues. Yeah, so right? in, so in the book there are links to a couple yeah. of online courses. One's called Launching Innovation in Schools. The other is called Design Thinking for Leading and Learning. Um, and they're like totally free, openly accessible courseware that you can translate into other languages. You can copy on other platforms. You can do anything you want with. Um, and then also for design thinking, um, there's a link in the book. But if you go to wiley.com/go/iterate, there are two design thinking workbooks. Um, which are like printable PDF workbooks. And one of them is about kind of like a toy design, um, doing a simple design thinking cycle with no real important, you know, it's helping someone redesign their morning routine or a party or a vacation or something like that. And then there's a second version, which is a great thing to do with a team that's interested in exploring these kind of human-centered design approaches. And a second one um, that's uh, um, uh, uh, guiding people through a school change process. Um, but I don't, awesome. hopefully Illinois State's library will have the book. So even if you don't want to buy it, you could. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I knew that, that you had that one piece of what you, of your work too is is the creating those those resources that that can be shared. The online courses can came open. first. We had, we had created yeah. a couple of these online courses, and for somewhere along the line, I was like, I think there's a book worth of stuff in here. Um, yeah. And uh, at one point, we like literally took all of the transcripts from the videos and the courses and put it into a giant word document and started sort of <laughs> sort of play with it so that's where this that's came great from. awesome and then your podcast also uh is available as well right? yeah yeah so the teach lab okay. podcast um the, awesome. the last couple of episodes are um about uh this book um but the ones before that um are probably the best work we've done with that it's called teacher speech and the new divide uh, and it's a bunch of lawyers and librarians and educators talking about divisive concept laws and book bans um, and the consequences for teaching, for teacher education, for libraries, uh, and ways to think about like, how do we organize to stop the madness and, and do better? Um, and so, uh, yeah, some pretty incredible stories that are, that are in some of those episodes.
Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure, uh, Anna. Will, Super nice yeah, to meet all you of bet. you. Um, thanks so much for hanging out. Have a great evening. Yes.